how old are your kids? 13 and 8. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Does that sum up your year? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been really good because, especially uh, you know, at the ages now where they're just growing and growing, so getting to see it and you know be present for it. And whereas before we would be on the road and doing all kinds of things, now I get to you know see them in the house, eat lunch with them, and, and the like. So that's been very, very good. That's, that's a good um, perspective. That's a really, it's a, it is truly a gift. So I just um, remember when my kids were at that, those ages and I, wow, it's a lot to be <laughs> <laughs> kind of sequestered with them. <laughs> that, that, that is an appropriate statement. We have uh, set schedules in place and keep redoing them. That's good. That's smart. Hey, good. seeing all kinds of friends tonight. How's it going, Brian? How's it going, Wendy? Douglas, how's it going? Adele, hi. How are you? Doing all right. Hello, everyone. Hello, Charlotte. And is hey, that Charlotte. Pam Pitt? Say that once more. Pam Pitt. Yeah, I see Pam Pitt's name on there. Okay. Is that is 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 she is she running your crowd, Douglas? <laughs> She's funny. another funny person. See. I don't see Pam much, but it's really bad, and I should because Pam and I actually are neighbors and share a gate. So I probably will see more more of her tonight than I've seen her uh, in a little bit. But yeah, we're right here in the neighborhood. I see her every now, every now and then. Great, and the boys see, are doing uh, okay. The boys are doing. Oh okay. yeah, boys doing great. Doing great. It's 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 you and Nicole. We have to worry about right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Cause they're gonna be okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dustin, for the technology tonight, and last for the introduction, and and Brian and Adele. Thank you. No problem. Hello, I just wanted to say hi to you, your old friend Denise. Yeah. How's it going, Denise? Fine. It's good to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. So you got a, so you got a full house coming here, Douglas. Oh yeah, it's in uh, familiar faces. Is that Pierre? Yes, sir. How's it going? It's going well. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Yeah. It's a, a, a good crowd, a known crowd. I'm a midtowner as well, so <laughs> obviously I used to see people around town. Now you see them behind the mask. <laughs> Hello there. Hello there, Miss Pam. Pam. Good to see you. You too. I only yeah. see your mail. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Douglas, I hear your boys uh, when I'm out in the back. Sometimes I hear them <laughs> playing a rough and ready game of basketball. <laughs> I don't know how rough and ready it is, but <laughs> they're out there. Uh, Lee on the other on the other side of me says, right. "If one thing they my boys go out and uh, for everybody else go out and play basketball, we put them out every day to play basketball." Right. Like, I don't know how if they're getting better at basketball, but it's sure getting better at conversation. They talk, <laughs> Lord, they talk all day like some old men at, at the coffee shop. They, just, <laughs> they carry on conversation. It's like shoot basketball, get to work. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. This is BJ. Hi, BJ. How are Hello. you? Oh, great. How are you, Charlotte? Great. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. You know, you're going to hear some good stuff tonight, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. What, Dusty, you want us to go on and get started? Yeah, we can get started. I was trying to send uh, Douglas the option to share his screen, but I can't seem to find it up on here. But um, if you wanted to email me the slides too, I could try to share it that way. Okay. Email in the chat here.
How's it going, Brian? We're good. Okay, great. Here comes Drew and Pan. Hi. Hi, Pan. Hey. All right, I just send them all back, send them over to you. Yes, it buys. Sounds good. Peace with the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> Double Scarborough. Got a whole bunch of folks. <laughs> Good. Adele, it's good to see you. Okay. Bye -bye. While we're waiting, Rick, uh, I like your stellar performance there. No, I just, this is not a virtual background. I actually am calling you from very long distance. <laughs> <laughs> Out of space? <laughs> yeah, I, I worked at a deal with uh, Elon Musk. And <laughs> it, it gave me a good price. <laughs> Love it. I love the breeze that's going through your hair too, and you know <laughs> that's pure COVID. <laughs> pure COVID, gotcha. <laughs> Not weightlessness; it's COVID. No, no weightless. So <laughs> I'm still waiting for the weightless part. You know? <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> well, yeah, that'll be a miracle. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, so how are you doing, Panic Carl? Doing good. Just ducky, just ducky. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, we're fine. Thank good you. Idea. You both too. Well, Miss it. <laughs> yeah. And we had our first shot. Yeah. That means one, we're one, old. One of the advantages oh, yeah. being old. <laughs> Yeah, Very I old. Know, you guys, I just say you're 70th birthday party. So. <laughs> <Okay>, check. <laughs> Charlotte, in the interim, did you want me to do something about Ryla? And, and yeah, are you volunteering? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's it's the time it's your period. thing. Yeah, I know the time period is very short, and you didn't say in your email, so I couldn't tell if you had somebody in mind or. But if you want me to, well, uh, Dustin's really busy now with his new job, and also, if oh, you could pick up the slack, yeah, he'll have to tell us about it once he once he gets all his stuff worked out. Yeah, he has an exciting new adventure to oh. carry us all on and we'll be part of it. So it's not just a job, it's a mission. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. so we're would, proud of him. Would you send me his, cause I don't think I have his info, his email and I'll keep him up to date with what, and I will contact the person at Central High School again. Sure, okay, be glad to. Yeah, sure. I don't know what they're doing, if they'll do anything about it, but you know. It's worth a try. Thank you for, many, thank you for offering. Sure, how many? Because it's less expensive this year. Yeah, I'll send it to you because I'm not sure okay. offhand, but I'll send you the email. All right. Yeah, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Sure. Hello, Judge. 
skip 0% for 63 months on select new 2021 models now through February 1st. Broken windshield, take one. Hey guys, my windshield just got broken. I feel like I need to blow off some steam. Let's go. <laughs> Mr. Blank, there's no need to be stressed. Geico makes it easy to file a claim online on the app or over the phone. Yeah, but what if I never hear back? That's going to make me want to go. <laughs> no, you guys, the claim team is always there for you. That makes me want to celebrate with some fireworks. Five, six, seven, go, 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 go. <laughs> Okay, I think we are ready. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Justin, we might need to mute everybody except for the speaker and yourself. And the door? Lock the door. And of course, your TV. Resume the meeting. Yep, um, I'll work on muting everyone. Uh, if you are not on mute, uh, please try to mute yourself. I can't see our picture anymore. Sound is working. Okay, Charlotte. Um I don't know if my sound is working, but uh, if we're ready to begin, uh, we can introduce Douglas. Les is introducing him. Okay. Well, welcome, Douglas. Um, Douglas Scarborough is Senior Vice President and leads the Memphis branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis which serves Western Tennessee, Eastern Arkansas, and Northern Mississippi. He became head of the Memphis branch in June of 2015. Uh, Mr. Scarborough serves on the boards of several organizations, including the Better Business Bureau, Barrett School of Banking, Church Health, Le Bonner Hospital National Leadership Council, Start Co, and the State of Tennessee Health Services and Development Agency. Uh, Mr. Scarborough previously was director of the Office of Talent and Human Capital with the City of Memphis. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science from Morehouse College, an MBA from Campbell University, a Master's in Healthcare Administration from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and an EdD in Adult Education from the University of Memphis. He's also completed programs at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and at Harvard Business School. So uh, Douglas, welcome to uh, our Rotary meeting. We're very much looking forward to your presentation. Les, thanks a ton. Uh, always happy to be here. And Charlotte, thank you for the invitation. And like I said earlier, it's always good to see a, a number of friends uh, on the Zoom call and uh, hopefully new friends as well. Um, Look forward to, I'm going to talk to you about some of the Mid-South uh, economic impact data that we have. Uh, all of this data is, you know, stuff that's publicly available that we have on certain websites. Uh, also, some of it is pulled from some other data sources as well. Actually, this is uh, during our blackout time, so usually don't uh, talk about forward-looking uh, projections because the FOMC is actually meeting and we have a period of time that we you know, not talking as much, but also not changing or doing any new information on the website. And tomorrow, they'll actually have the results of the FOMC meeting, and then that blackout period usually ends uh, on, uh, it will end on this Friday. Uh, next slide, please. And this is disclaimer. And actually, is it a way, could you make the slides just a little bit smaller? 
And I think we can see we can see yeah, the middle see of the screen. It might be able to a view option to uh there we go. Yeah, yeah. Down a little bit more so that we can see the hit. Yeah, that's good. There you go. And on the previous slide that you would see, it was actually my disclaimer. So everybody that works with the Federal Reserve uh, and the Federal Reserve system. So I'll talk about that just a little bit, uh, what the differences are in those. But everybody works for the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. The only person that speaks on behalf of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis is our president, Jim Bullard. The only person that speaks on behalf of the Federal Reserve System is the chair, Jerome Powell. So all of these comments are uh, my own comments and they're uh, attributed to me. And, you know, if anybody has, I know everybody's muted out now, but as I'm going through, if anybody has questions, by all means, you know, feel free to ask questions. I'll, if it's something I'm going to get to in a little bit, uh, you know, I'll tell you that we'll get to it or explain a little bit and then hit on it when we get to that slide a little bit later. So tonight we'll talk about a, a few different things, uh, do some talks like this, is, you know, not only giving an understanding of the Federal Reserve, because a number of people have uh, been, you know, possibly to our building that's downtown where we have a branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis talk to you about the district, but uh, Fed is a unique entity. So talk to you some about how it is the entity, how it's set up and how we work. Then also talk about the Memphis zone, uh, the Metropolitan Statistical Social, uh, Economic Performance, so for our MSA, what it looks like. The Bayes book, this is a book that we produce that comes out in conjunction with the FOMC, those Federal Open Market Committee meetings. And for that book, uh, it's information that's anecdotal information that's not going to be, you know, research based. Usually it's not a chart, it's actually in the one that was in late last year, in December of last year, had some charts in it that I'll show uh, there. And then also show some research as well about the long term belief scarring effects from Julian Kozlowski, who's one of our economists that works in the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis up in uh, St. Louis. The link that you have, you see it down there. Also, you'll see it on the bottom of your screen. Where St. Louis Fed uh, forward slash COVID dash 19 is you know, a, a host of resources. So we have all kind of resources that are available online, things that are coming from the economists, coming from uh, you know, people in the bank all around COVID. So we started this at the beginning back in March, and there's uh, you know, a good diversity of information there. So if you ever are looking for anything, by all means, you can go to that and then be able to, you know, in a couple clicks, find a lot of really good information. And also, it's easy to take some of this information. I'll uh, show a chart later on that was done in our Federal Reserve Economic uh, Data. And it's really easy to go in. We call it FRED for short. It's really easy to go into FRED, click, and then make it a PowerPoint slide uh, like I've done here. So those are always resources I want to make sure people know about. Next slide. And this one, I think, got uh, changed up a little bit. Uh, I was going to say I have uh, animations in uh, upcoming couple of slides. So I hope that those uh, translate. But this one, I think, in the transfer got uh, changed a little bit. But it's three basic parts of the Federal Reserve that we have. And for those parts, we have the Board of Governors, which you can see the beginning here. And then you also have the regional banks. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. And then you have the Federal Open Market Committee. The Fed is a quasi-governmental organization. So parts of the Fed are actually private. Parts of the Fed are, are public or governmental entity. The Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., those are mostly government employees. So those governors that you, that you hear about, people that are doing research and staff that are there in Washington, D.C., are government employees. As you get out into the regional banks, and you see here where you see you know, throughout the United States, you have 12 different districts. A majority of those districts are actually in the along the eastern seaboard, and they're along the eastern seaboard because a little over 100 years ago, about 103 years ago, when the Fed was created, it was created based upon centers of commerce and centers of population. So at that time, actually, St. Louis was the fourth largest city uh, by population in the United States. So St. Louis is uh, one of the heads that are, has a regional bank for the Federal Reserve Bank. And then you can see, you know, throughout the nation as well, where those others are located. The Federal Open Market Committee, that's one that you hear a lot about. That is the one that sets the federal funds rate. So when you're, you know, have an interest rate or like, 
and it's set and it's based upon usually that rate and then some above that. So uh, bankers, and that's usually what they're earning the additional, uh, their additional profits uh, based upon that. Next slide. And uh, this slide is actually of the Memphis zone. So the slide that you saw earlier is the whole United States. The small box that you see are the seven states that are in the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis's district. The only state that we have uh, completely is the state of Arkansas. So I have a piece of Arkansas and then Robert Hopkins, my counterpart that runs the Little Rock branch as the other piece of Arkansas. But you see here, so usually when I'm talking, I'm talking about the Memphis zone. Uh, unless I say specifically the Memphis MSA, then I'm talking about this area here. And as you can see, it covers, you know, mostly majority of the counties are in northern Mississippi, but then also counties in eastern, excuse me, in western Tennessee and also eastern Arkansas. And we have a board of directors, not only for the St. Louis uh, head office, but then for the Memphis branch as well. And we deliberately have individuals that are from throughout the zone. So we have about three directors that are from here in Memphis, Michael Uecki, uh, Eric Robertson, and Kathy uh, Buckman Gibson. But then we also have directors that are from, we have one that's in Dyersburg, Tennessee now, one that's in Jonesboro, Arkansas, somebody else that's based down in Greenwood, uh, Mississippi. And we have one more oh, over in uh, Bev Carlson that's over in Tupelo, Mississippi. Not only are they, it, not only are the diverse based upon the areas of the Memphis zone that they represent, and that's true as you look at all the boards of the Federal Reserve, but then also they're very diverse based upon the industries that they're in and also race and gender, because we're very mindful about, you know, not only the number of men and women that we have on the bank, not only the number based upon race that we have, but then also uh, because what happens is that every board meeting, we have eight board meetings a year, they're coming in and they're bringing in information. So when they're bringing the information, they're bringing it not only from the zone in their area, they're bringing about their particular area or, or about their particular industry that they work in that they cover. So when it comes to a meeting, uh, Michael Uecki from Methodist is going to come talk to us about health care. Obviously, there's been a lot of conversation about that lately. And then, for instance, uh, Hank Reichley, who is with uh, Staple Cotton down in Greenwood, Mississippi, is going to talk to us about agriculture. And what it does is allows us to be able to get a good insight into what's happening here in the Memphis zone. And then that same thing is done in the other zones and done for uh, St. Louis, uh, St. Louis uh, as, a, as a whole as well. Next slide. So this is, uh, I'll talk some about national economic trends and also we'll talk about some of the Memphis economic slides. So next slide. This is the most recent uh, media and all of this, like I said, is available on the site. Uh, this is the most, the most recent conversation our president, Jim Buller, has had. It was on January 13th. And this one, yeah, this is one he did on, right after he, he did a session with the Wall Street Journal. And it was a Reuters uh, next virtual forum. And he was talking about a couple of things here. So he's talking about the recovery and saying that, you know, obviously as you know the pandemic is going on, he's been uh, uh, more bullish on the pandemic and saying, all right, you know, we had a temporary shutdown based upon a public health crisis, based upon the pandemic. As we start to handle that pandemic, then you'll start to see, you know, recovery in certain areas and recovery in uh, certain revenues. And I'll talk about that later on with uh, with revenues here specifically uh, for Memphis as well. He also has noted and starts talking about, you know, saying the stage is set to start seeing some rise in inflation. But what the committee is going to do is in the, in the FOMC that's meeting uh, today and tomorrow, what they're going to do is that they make data dependent decisions. So based upon what it looks like and what they're seeing from the zones, what they hear from our branches, what they hear from our board of directors and like, then they'll make decisions uh, based upon that. And that will also, the data dependent decision also applies to, to the amount of money supply. Because as you all know, the Fed, uh, very early on in March, under the guidance of our uh, chair, Jerome Powell, you know, put in a number of different facilities. We actually stood up nine different facilities to support because we're a lender of last resorts. We are not like, you know, federal government, where it's fiscal policy, where we're giving money directly. We are lending money. But we, for that lend, being that lender of last resort, nine different programs that focus on different areas from corporations to small business to governments and the like. 
and we stood up to make sure that uh, the economy still had a, the amount of liquidity in it that it needed. So with those, it was a lot more than what we needed, but you know, we didn't know, you don't know in March how bad it's gonna be. So you do have some of those that are starting to roll off now because they you know, are no longer needed. So that's some of what uh, Jim was talking about there in this presentation. You can go online and everything, like I said, is there. And if you even wanna watch uh, this segment, uh, yeah, that was about 30 minutes long, but you can watch the segment and watch his uh, report there. Next slide. This is one, we have a lot of information that's done on multiple levels. So we have stuff that's written, you know, from kid level all the way up to PhD economist level. And this is one from my own the economy blog. It's good because we're able to talk about things uh, very quickly as they were happening. I always like this article came out October of last year because what it did is a lot of people were, were looking at it and were concerned about the recession that was uh, caused by the pandemic and we're comparing it especially with the severity of the initial decrease so you know from that march time frame you know the first two quarters after that you saw a street you saw you know the economy just drop off a, off, off a cliff and people were concerned about it you know is this going to be like the great depression and as you can see here in as you can see here in the graph that's on uh your right hand side as you're looking at it that dotted line that dotted line looks at the second quarter so as you go on through two quarters, and what it's basically saying is for the 2020 recession, this pandemic recession uh, that we're in, that you see the severity and of the decrease initially being the same as the Great Depression. But then as you see that blue, that solid blue line, that Great Depression line, as you see, it continued on. So as you continue to have quarter after quarter, you know, since the peak, you continue to have that down creep. As you look, and as you see for the blue chip consensus forecast, and also you see uh, there for the 2020 recession, you see it start to come back. And that is because, you know, like Jim was saying earlier, like I'll look at some of the spending patterns. Uh, I'll show you some of the spending patterns here in just a moment that it was a voluntary closing of shutting down of businesses, uh, you know, decreasing in mobility and activity because we're in a pandemic that is, you know, caused by, it is contagious, so it is caused by interaction of people. And in order to control that, you have to shut down some of that economic activity. But actually, you start to see some of that activity go, you know, go in some air, some other areas. Some areas, you know, you've seen shutdowns. Obviously, you know, anybody that works in the hospitality industry, uh, hotels, restaurants, and the like, have seen a you know a tremendous decrease in activity, and you've seen that change in certain areas. So here, it's just saying, you know, initial severity as bad as the Great Depression, but not linked. So it's not going to be as long. Next. This is uh, information. I have a few slides actually from them. Opportunity Insights, and they have an economic tracker. One of the things that we found during the recession is that you know we collect at the Fed a lot of data. We work with different data partners and get uh, information. And uh, this one is they you know are based at Harvard and do things in conjunction with a number of different data sources. Also in conjunction with other universities uh, like Brown, they work with people like Paychex and Wombly and the like that are having credit card data and also uh, paycheck data. And they have tracked along the recession. And one of the things that we found is that, you know, the more immediate tracking and also tracking is based upon some of, not this slide, but some of the slides I have will be based upon week as opposed to, you know, sometimes we have information that will come in one, once a quarter, but you want to get as much information as quickly as you hand, can in small time frames. So you know, you'll see that, and they've done a great job of that, as you'll see in future slides. And this one, basically, it's comparing the Great Recession, so the recession of 2008, about uh, a little over 10 years ago now, with the COVID-19 or the pandemic recession. And as you can see here, you'll see the green is the Great Recession, and the yellow is the COVID-19. And you see where purchasing, uh, where purchasing and consumer spending was by sector. So you see durable goods, goods are going to last, you know, a really long time during the Great Recession. You see a lot more people uh, buying those, whereas during the COVID-19, you saw a lot less. But then services, you've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of services that people are buying during COVID-19. And we'll have a breakout, I think it is uh, in just a second, we'll have a breakout there. They'll show you some of the areas of where people are spending, you know, what went down and then what uh, rebounded initially. And, you know, even now being able to see a little bit more what has uh, gone on over time. 
Next slide. So this is another one from Opportunity Insights, and it's you know a number of lines here. And what this is doing is looking at spending and recovery. It's like I said, it's done on the weekly basis, and you can look here and see where people. And this is still national, so we'll get to Memphis here in just a moment. But you'll see, you know, the recovery. Uh, we're spending on pools actually was higher. So a lot of folks getting at home pools. I know even I was talking to one of my directors and, and they had a contact uh, with somebody that, you know, built and clean and uh, designed pools. And they were saying, and this was probably early in the summer. They're like, you know, if you want to get a pool done, then, you know, pretty much, unless you're already on the list, you can forget about it because people have changed because, you know, it, the thought pattern is that you're staying at home. And if you're staying at home, then you want you know your house to be as nice as you uh, can potentially have it. So you see that as well with landscaping and horticultural services, and then some uh, consumer spending. Obviously, airlines and barbershops. Uh, I don't know about you all. I haven't been to the barbershop since May. Uh, Pam probably might have heard me as well. Part of the conversations outside on Saturdays is I go outside, cut my hair, and cut my boys' hair as well. So we're right there in the backyard doing it like I'm sure some other people. And you have not seen. This is still early on, so this is uh, data and information. Uh, the observations are from uh, September timeframe, but then the last recorded on there is that April timeframe. You've seen you know, a little bit more recovery, but it's about the same. And a lot of it is based upon, you know, you do have some local conditions. So based upon, you know, safer at home uh, requirements and restrictions, and then also some businesses being closed. And you know, trying to either get PPE or be able to operate in a certain environment, and also some of what we saw, I remember early on that was very interesting, is that you would have conversation, you would have people that would say, okay, we need to open up these businesses because we you know we need to get back to profitability, we need to get back people to you know get an economy back on. And initially, you would see, and you've seen some of that still continue, is that you would open up those businesses and people weren't rushing back in. So you know. Folks, just because you open the movie theater back up doesn't mean that people feel comfortable as well going back into those movie theaters. And also what we've seen is they have had this conversation about this case style recovery where depending upon income, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, is how people have oriented to this recession. And you've seen a lot of those essential jobs, especially those frontline jobs where people have been losing work and uh, not been working. So, you know, people that would have disposable uh, income either are not having jobs or have a lot less disposable income than they did before. And, you know, they're no longer are, you know, taking advantage and doing things like they, and purchasing things like they uh, did before. Next slide. And this is going to hit on the Memphis economic trend. So you go ahead next. So this is a, a page that we actually have. And our unemployment rate currently, because I pulled this from just the other day, is at 6.9%. And that is about the same as what national unemployment is. And then you can look and see at the other areas from building permits. I'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, you know, we're all, uh, this is the Midtown Rotary Club. And uh, I'm sure you've seen a good amount of home activity and home for sale, especially I was even looking at uh, the Central Gardens home report that came in uh, earlier today. And they have the days of DOM, the days on market, they have the price, and they also have the square footage. And as you look at it, especially those homes, there was a lot of movement we saw in the larger data, and then I was seeing it on that form as well. Under 400,000, you see homes that literally were selling in, you know, seven days, a, a week or less, a lot of times in, uh, you know, one or two days, homes were moving. So that's why you see those building permits, you know, starting to go up, and you see a lot more people uh moving homes either to get more space or to be able to have uh, have uh, the kind of space they need, especially for folks that are, are working at home for a lot more of those, what we've seen in those non-essential jobs. And also you see some per op per capita income starting to come back for both uh, Tennessee and also come back from Mississippi as well. And a lot of that is tied, I'll have a slide, also a little bit about some of that's tied as well to uh, you know, people's comfort, Vaccines, uh, vaccines coming online, and also getting a you know better understanding of, of where we are and where the recovery is. Next slide. And this is one that just kind of shows how it goes, how our financial activity uh, dropped off a cliff. The gray bars, the gray vertical bars you see, are recessions. 
So you can see, you know, 2008 recession there, you can see one, uh, 2003, and that's where you have a quarter or more negative economic or negative uh, GDP growth. The one that's furthest to your right, the red line, as you see it just kind of drop off there. As you saw, you know, 2015, we're starting to, you know, increase and start to get back. Still had not, for the Memphis MSA, we still had not gotten, if you look at that gray bar uh, that is almost kind of in the middle of the screen for 2008, and you see the level that we were at for uh, financial activity at 33, we still had not gotten back to, we were at almost 30 before the pandemic happened. So we're still, you know, we're recovering and coming back, but we're still not back to where we were pre-pandemic and not back as well to where we were based upon financial activity uh, before 2008. So we still have, you know, growing to do. Next slide. This is one that I found interesting is from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And uh, one of their economists had done a study and he looked at, and this is early on, I've used this slide uh, uh, repeatedly. And he was saying, you know, based upon the recovery, and you can see, you know, look at the bold line there for uh, total. And also you can see the local line as well. You can see, uh, you can, he was making a prediction about what the revenue loss would look like uh, if we had either B-shaped recovery. So if it was, and a lot of the recovery has been based upon the response to the pandemic and saying that, all right, if you have, you know, heard up, you know, been able to, you know, shut things down. Like for instance, the only growing economy that we've seen internationally, I think China was at maybe two or three percent, 2.5, I think, uh, or 2.6% uh, last year is a report that came out late last week, or early this week. And a lot of it is even, I remember reading reports early on in China where, you know, very stringent lockdowns, uh, not only from the airports and like, but even to, you know, the one I remember is even to the one where they nail people's doors closed and tore up roads. So when folks were, you know, getting out and violating uh, protocols for COVID, they would tear the, tear the street up. So you couldn't drive a car, you couldn't get out, and then your door was nailed closed, so you had to stay inside. And with that, you saw some of that recovery in the economy. Here, you'll see a slower recovery, and or what was predicted for fiscal year 2021 was a slower recovery if you had that, you know, slow loss. And he was predicting then, you know, even the potential of a second wave and as you have more waves, you have more loss in the economy. So we're in, you know, even the third wave. And I think I know our seven day moving average is starting to go down now. But even with that third wave that's tied to as well, as you have more waves of the pandemic, you're shutting down more economic activity or shutting down people's activity. And as you shut down people's activity, that shuts down uh, the amount of economic activity that's taking place. Next slide. This is getting into uh, more of the Memphis information. Like I said, I always like this uh, economic tracker. So here, same thing that you're seeing for the nation for Memphis employment rate. So this, you see about a 10 point gap between people that have a middle wage. And for them, they describe middle wage is $27,000 a year to $60,000 a year. So if you have a, a $27,000 a year to $60,000 a year job in Memphis, you'll see that change in employment where you see about 7% of them have lost jobs, whereas you see almost 17% for people that are up under $27,000 a year. So, you know, we've seen this, and this is that case out recovery that I was talking about earlier, that the poor you are, the hardest pandemic is hitting. And a lot of that has to do directly with, you know, not only the jobs that you have, so if you had, you know, a frontline job or you had a job that uh, especially Especially, you've seen a lot in the hospitality industry, uh, you know, restaurants, hotels, and the like. Where once the pandemic started getting bad, they started shutting down. They started, and when they shut down, they have to start laying off people. And you've been able to see some of those businesses uh, survive due to the payment protection program or the PPP. But you've seen a lot of uh, job loss with those particular type of employees uh, under, you know, your lower wage employees that usually have been the central employees, those frontline ones. Uh, you've seen a lot and really be affected by uh, unemployment and also affected as well by the rates of infection as well. Next Mr. slide. Mr. Scarborough, Thanks. this is so huh? small that it's virtually impossible to see for, on our screen. I've got a laptop and, and that was a fascinating slide, but it, it's, it's, 
and it's hard uh, hard to see. I can do this it, as well. It, what I'll do is I'm it, yeah, that's better. Okay, if, so if, I'm talking not, through it, and then yeah, I'll send out. Uh, I'll make this a PDF, and then uh, we'll send it to you all as well. This is a slide that was actually yeah. This is I talked about this one, so we can go on to the next one. And the next one is one that I know has the animation on it and might not. Yeah, it won't transfer, but I'll be able to, I can talk through it uh, as well. So here, what we did is I was looking at actually three slides and it was showing uh, Memphis small business activity. And small business as defined by the SBA depends upon you know the activity. The reason that, that they did this, and I found it interesting because they, in the paper, they were uh, talking about this. They did small business as opposed to, you know, larger kind of retail. So you're, say, a Walmart or even, you know, even though it's based here, AutoZone and the like, but your smaller businesses, because those are local businesses, those are ones that are independently owned. And that is ones where you're going to see, you know, more impact based upon the pandemic, because that are the ones where it's closer to people. And that's the ones where they're visiting. And a lot of times, a lot more times they're going to visit them. And, like, you know, for instance, you're going to go to, you know, say, you know, a local business here in Midtown, you're going to physically go to that business as opposed to going online and participating uh, via e-commerce. So because of that, you see a lot more activity. In uh, the slides I have, this is the third one in a set of slides I have that would, would uh, do with the animation. But here is talking about professional and business services. So uh, the other areas that you're seeing, you know, hospitality, uh, retail, uh, healthcare services, education, you've seen losses that lead to that 20, 22% less small business in Memphis. But where you've seen, where you've been able to see growth actually during the pandemic, and this is going from the beginning of the year to so going from, you know, beginning of January 2020 to December 31st of 2020, professional business services. So that is, you know, law firms, uh, financial services firms, you've actually seen in Memphis a growth in those over time. So about 20% growth in professional business services. So that is, uh, you know, when people have, you know, have a number of conversations and people are asking or say, you know, where is it that you're seeing uh, is always, you know, even in, a, even in recession, you're going to see some bright spots in the economy or some areas of growth in the economy. And this has been one of the areas that you've seen uh, growth in. And this is a slide as well, where even not only, you know, information by week, but some of them on the bottom that tells you like, you know, when you had the first case, when you had the stimulus payment starts, because obviously that's going to make a change in some of that data. All right, next slide, please. And here, this is looking at a uh, total decrease in the revenue. So before it was the number of businesses open. So you saw, you know, 22% uh, of businesses closing before. Now you're looking at actual revenue. So when you look at revenue the same way as in the past, you have those areas, obviously if the business is closing, uh, they have less revenue or, you know, once they close, they have no revenue. And then you have ones that are having increased revenue and there are ones that continue to be open. And those are that, that uh, the bright spot, like I was talking about earlier, are, the, are those professional business services. So, you know, a lot of it is you look at the transition, like I said, financial services firms, law firms, uh, ones that are able to, not have frontline employees uh, be able to work from home. They're able to work, you know, over the internet. I know uh, I have, I've been at home since March where, you know, we get out every now and then and do stuff, but I haven't had to physically go in and we still are able to operate 90% of our employees at the bank. And we have about 1400 employees and, you know, based between most of St. Louis, but also between St. Louis, Little Rock, Louisville, and we have a couple of other locations as well. And the majority of those 90% of those employees, and we're, you know, doing, we're processing cash. We are doing, when you hear about the economic income uh, payments that are going out, St. Louis is integral in producing and uh, processing those. When you're processing, even we serve as a fiscal agent for the U.S. Treasury. So as you're paying your, uh, paying your taxes, paying, uh, you know, fees to the National Park or the like, we're processing those. So we have a lot of different functions that are going on in the Federal Reserve and it's similar to other companies and still operating, still, you know, still going in as we have been since March. So those are the areas, those uh, knowledge worker jobs or, you know, what they call before white collar jobs before, you're still seeing some growth in those. You know, here in the Memphis market, 
and you see it uh, in other markets as well. Next slide. Here, this one's active and, uh, and, and busy, but it captures a lot of good information. So this is talking about consumer spending and saying that overall consumer spending in Memphis is uh, down slightly. So it's been down by uh, 1.8%. But then as you look at the areas to see what is buttressing, like, you know, what you see that number in the middle and you think, all right, I always think whenever I get a total number, what goes into the number? What, what are the factors going into that? On the high end, you're seeing healthcare. There's been a lot, you know, while I was showing that some of the healthcare business closing, a lot more spending on healthcare. Obviously, you know, we're all concerned about our health and, uh, you know, whether it is personal uh, protective equipment, PPE, whether it's, you know, doctor's visits, online uh, visits, or any of that healthcare spending has actually, for Memphis, been up 18%. But then as you look at entertainment and recreation, that's down almost 50%. So then you end up with a total spending being down about 1.8%. So you can imagine, you know, how much you're spending in the U.S. economy. We actually, we had a, a economist that was coming in and, and we were talking about, you know, how many expenditures and actually was talking about because so many people uh, have the perception if you see so many things that are made in China and the thought pattern was, you know, even he was asking a question like, you know, how much do you think of your spending is actually done on items that are made in China, but actually are going to, you know, uh, items that are made in China and things that, you know, in the book and the article that he wrote is actually only 3%. So 3% of what the American economy was spending at that time, was a couple of years ago, uh, on made in China ob objects were only about 3%. And that's because you look at the majority of your large expend or your largest expenditures. And like we saw services that was up earlier, where, you know, what you spend with your doctor, what you spend with your attorneys, what you spend on education, a lot more, you spend a lot more money on those things here locally than you do on physical goods uh, internationally. Next slide, please. So this is uh, information on the Beige Book. The Beige Book is the one I talked about earlier. We actually uh, produce this. Each Federal Reserve Bank, so each of uh, the regional banks produces one, and it's on their particular area. So we talk about a lot of things that are specific to us. Uh, this is uh, a chart. Usually this is just anecdotal information. So, you know, if you ever talk to or, uh, or if you ever do in the future, usually it'll be a conversation and we'll get information and if we always keep it anecdotal, so we, we always keep it, it's always anecdotal, but we also always keep it uh, confidential. So if you're on there, say if I was you know, talking to Adele, it would say a Memphis banker said. And so this information was at the end of 2020. It was asking what they expect or how people expect local economic conditions to change during the remainder of the year. And this is asked uh, in the middle part of the year, about the end of the year. And as you can see, you can see the uh, eighth district and that's that dark line. And then you can see the lighter blue line with the triangles, that's Memphis. And you can see that they were thinking that our economy would start to improve towards the end of the year, start to prove and be a little bit better than uh, the national economy. And this is just kind of, you know, almost uh, consumer confidence uh, here for our particular area of what people were interested in. Next slide. And this is another one of how do you expect the, uh, local economic conditions to change during the remainder of the year. So during the remainder of 2020, what they, uh, what they expect, and it's, it expectation is a lot more people thought it was going to be slightly worse. And then you have a you know, decent collection there, slightly better to better in the Memphis zone. And some of that you know, is based upon what we were seeing with the, trend, the, amount, the transmission rate that we were having in the community. Obviously, at the end of last year, that transmission rate was uh, on the way up. And like I said, you know, they were even talking about a second wave and we already are kind of in and, and coming down and out of a third wave here. But some of that local economic conditions directly being tied to how much uh, the instances of disease in community and transmission of the disease and of the virus in the community. Next slide. And here are some of the, you know, most of the base book like that information before was so in the last year. This is the one that's actually from January. Most of the base book is just uh, text. There's not a lot of uh, information, but I like it because it's text and it's usually a lot of stories and uh, information behind it. And here, this is looking at January. 
and uh, January of this year, and you see in that uh, it's kind of mixed changes in employment levels. You've still seen a lot of hiring, especially in logistics and also in your manufacturing sector. A lot of it is you're seeing a lot of hiring, and even in one of the conversations we were having with, um, we have different uh, councils that we run, and we have I run the Transportation Council, uh, being from Memphis, and we have three others uh, in agribusiness, real estate, and also healthcare that we do twice a year. And we're having a conversation, and one of the people there was from Walmart. I think they said they had hired uh, about 500,000 people, and a lot of it was replacing people. Not only or replace not only replacing people, you know, permanently in jobs. What would happen is you would have a lot of people that are, you know, especially in our manufacturing sector where you know you try to do as much social distance as, as possible, but you have folks that are getting sick, that are concerned about conditions, and they were allowing people, Walmart was allowing people to take off as needed, so you had to backfill with both part time and full time employees. So you have a lot of hiring there. They said wage pressures have increased slightly. So you've had some tightening on uh, labor market conditions. So you're seeing people, you're seeing those wages go up just a little bit, not you know, a tremendous amount. This is across the district, but we've seen that, and I've heard uh, some of that here for the Memphis uh, area as well. Reports on consumer spending were mixed. So you see you know, uh, what we're spending on. I think I have a, a slide here in a moment. I'll talk, uh, talk about, or we talked about it earlier, uh, you know, the areas and things that we're spending on. We see people spending less on haircuts, a lot more on pools. And that has changed as well as you look for acceleration to online shopping. So that's why it was important for us to look at the small businesses earlier because, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I think every time I go to my front door, there's a box from Amazon, Walmart, or somewhere else on the porch. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing my, my share of evergreen packaging and evergreen uh, and IP. I'm sure they, you know, they produce the cardboard boxes. I'm sure they're happy with me and a number of other people because, I've been doing a lot more online shopping and that's, you know, even potentially changing some of that consumer behavior. Uh, activity in the manufacturing sector is continued to be robust, but it's remained below year ago levels. Uh, Jonesboro, Arkansas, not far from here. They are a big producer. They're in the Memphis zone. Big producer of, you know, of kind of frozen foods and, and manufactured food, processed foods and the like. And manufacturing, they've had a lot of increase, but it's even you know, as they talk about, even with that increase, you have an area like that that you said enough of a decrease in other areas that it's still growth, but it's growth because, you know, it's almost where you have a strong dip and then now you're starting to grow up and you're starting to grow out of that dip, but you're still not back to where you were before. Next slide. Here uh, is the next, second part of the base book. I'm talking about our banking contacts and showing uh, growth in loan volumes. And then stronger demo, stronger demand potentially coming up with PPP. We have seen it, and this is still true. Uh, having uh, have regular conversations uh, with bankers that they had a lot of money in uh, due to PPP, and then for folks that were still working, that uh, you know you had a decrease in, in travel and decrease in uh, expenditures and other and other areas, and you start to see those deposits were way up and still are. Uh, you know, tremendously high for especially a number, a number of regional and uh, smaller local banks. But then they're showing those loan values are, you know, slowing because, you know, people are needing less, you know, paying off credit cards. They have a little bit more money in their pockets and they need uh, are making less loans. But then also you see the stronger demand and potential coming months. The reason for the PVP funding and you've seen, you know, those deposits be really high. But the reason for the funding was, you know, for when you need that money for when uh, the pandemic is continuing on to continue to employ people, to continue to pay for goods and services and the like. So that's why you're still seeing those levels high, but starting to you know, go down some as people expend based upon uh, their needs. Non-financial sectors, they've remained relatively unchanged. Uh, passenger traffic uh, is down at airports uh, or has, has risen slightly, but it's still down you know, tremendously from uh, what it was in the past. Uh, one thing that he said here, logistics contact, I'm assuming, you know, usually we're talking logistics, we're talking about the Memphis zone. They said that 2021 would be better than 2020, but that potential regulation. So that's always been a concern, especially as, you know, there's a lot of concern, a lot of conversation uh, when uh, the Trump administration was uh, in part in doing a lot of the tariffs and the like. But then now re regulations on heavy industry and low oil and gas pipeline investment, and that could be a, have an impact for uh, trans, 
transported commodities. And then seasonally adjusted existing home sales, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, it, it, inventory has become a problem, especially I know before it was homes that were under and still is a lot of homes are under 400,000. You've seen a fall, as it says here, fall slightly for Memphis, but you're seeing, still seeing a rapid activity in home sales. I know, you know, like I said earlier, I live in Midtown as well, live here in Central Garden, and they have been, even as I look, you know, in the neighborhood and on, even on my street, you know, several houses that sold in a week or less. And I, I think that that is not anything that, as long as that activity and as long as people are still interested, I, I think you're going to have that continue on. I would say at least through, uh, you know, probably late spring, early summer, we'll start to see as the, as the virus, excuse me, as the vaccine, not the virus, as the vaccine becomes more widespread in the community and more people get that, we'll see how people respond with, you know, what that return or what that new workforce or new workplace looks like, because that's you know, a lot of our conversation at the bank is, it's not going to look like, you know, how we had it before. It's going to look different. So I am thinking a lot of the conversation has been that they think that people will be working, you know, from home, maybe a couple of days, two or three days a week in the office. Some um, have waves of people that are going to the office and, and coming out. So as that is the case, you'll still have some adjustment and uh, what people need so far as home space based upon their work schedules as well. Next slide. So this was information and research. Actually, uh, Julian Koslowski came and presented to us. Uh, it's probably uh, middle of last year. It was actually a really good information that I thought was important. I even remember having a conversation uh, with my boss and we were talking about the amount that we're spending in, at the bank on travel. And it was a lot of money that we're spending on travel before that has gone now, down now. We have more money to spend on, on technology. And one of the things I was saying was that, you know, I can see some of this budget for travel, it being a long-term thing, because what you did is that you actually got through a different, a different fiscal year. By going so long and by having travel, business travel restricted as long as it's been, it's giving people enough time to do a new budget and in that new budget, see new play, new ways they can work, and you start to make value judgments based upon uh, what you used, you know, before you didn't necessarily think about where, you know, on a regular basis, I would go to St. Louis, and a lot of it was I would go, you know, having group meetings and having face-to-face -face meetings with certain people in the bank, and now we, you know, do them online, and even I think once we're out of, out of this and we have a lot more, uh, taking of the vaccine in community and start to see that transmission rate start to start to go down, I still think you're going to look at it and say, all right, you know, what's the reason of me having to drive, you know, a total of four, a total of eight hours, get a hotel and like when I can do some of this uh, online. So the scarred effects that uh, Julian talked about was the change behavior after the immediate health crisis is resolved. So once we get into the new normal that we get to, will behavior start to change and it starts to see the, the long run effect it depends on where the bankruptcies and change in habit make existing capital obsolete so if you have how we existed before and how uh you know liquidity was done how you know money was transferred before if that becomes obsolete we start figuring out a different way in order to and people get really used to it you know as like i was mentioning you know amazon boxes in the porch it used to be, you know, because we were going out to Mike Rose and doing a number of other things, it was nothing where I don't think I ever ordered uh, online from Costco because it was a thing where I knew I was going to be out and be close to, close to there or we would just make a trip and say, all right, you know, we're going out east. We're going to hit Costco, hit a couple other places and bring it back. But now it's going on long enough and it has kind of the belief scarring effect where just, as a matter of fact, I just heard the, uh, the door open. So I've got a feeling Costco is just, gotten to my door downstairs where I don't even think about going out to uh, Costco now, going to certain places. I just get on my phone or get on my phone and order it. And as people get more used to that and that existing, you know, capital, that face-to-face -face starts to become obsolete, then you have those scoring effects that will uh, become permanent. Also policies that avoid most permanent separation. The longer people are separated from work, the longer people, especially as you have those essential, uh, Essential employees with people that were laid off in certain industries, the longer they're out of the work, the more permanent it becomes. So you want to be able to have, and that's why you've seen all these programs and all the talk of stimulus 
and the like, because if you don't get those people back, the more likely that they will stay un unemployed. Next slide. Here's talking some more about those long-term belief scarring, saying workers in rigid occupations and central se essential sectors, so uh, people that do have jobs, like I said, we have about 10% of our, our, our employees at the bank. And we're not, you know, not laying anybody off, but uh, I can think about it with other industries. But uh, we have about 10 percent of our employees that they're in a rigid, rigid occupation where they're you know, think about the Memphis branch. They're either working in cash, working in law enforcement. Those jobs can't be good. We're not going to let people count money at home. It's, it's just, you know, you, we can do a lot of things that doesn't that's not going to happen. And because of that, then those are the ones jobs like that are you know, some of the ones that have been hardest hit and can be hardest hit by this. And then here's also saying there's a positive correlation between the economic exposure to the pandemic and the financial vulnerability uh, to, the, to the effects of the pandemic as well. So the closer people, like, that's why you've seen the same groups that have the high exposure rates and that have gotten COVID more are the ones that are also economically exposed. So, you know, you have to go out and work face to face. You have to, you know, if you're a cashier at a grocery store, you know, you're going to see a number of people. You, you know, as a cashier at a grocery store, you're not going to, you know, usually that's not going to be on the higher end of income. So not only are you much more likely to be a, be at risk of getting the back the virus, you also are much likelier to have economic exposure as well. Next slide. And this is one that shows the difference in this recession and past recessions. Past recessions, because of the way they hit, because of the areas they affected, have been you know, man sessions. It's been mostly men losing jobs. And you, you know, didn't have it in the U.S. until about the 50s or 60s, where you have more women coming into the workforce. And then this has been the first time you can see here from the uh, 50s where you see the loss of jobs and you see in the red, the last one, this is loss in jobs of women. And it is you know, a, a real concern because as we've seen from COVID-19 that there's been more women than men. A lot of that has been, as you look at the industries where women are predominantly employed, then you have, you know, especially in the hospitality industries, you've had a lot more uh, women that are employed there that end up being laid off. Also, you had a lot more where you know, look at duties at home and look at uh, child care. And it, you know, even though you may have a two parent household, it is more likely, and you've you seen it in several cases where, or several research studies where the woman is doing the, the care in the home. And because she's doing the care in the home, then there is the less employment and there uh, is a, for a harder hit recession on women due to this. Uh, the way that this pandemic hit, and even as you think about and trying to do work at home, you know, was talking about earlier with, you know, we have two kids and we, my wife and I said, we were both very happy and very fortunate. Our boys are old enough that, you know, we can get them on the computers in the morning. We can check on them during the day, but it is a thing where if we had younger kids, it's, you know, you got to make a decision of, are you going to send them out to daycare somewhere and have potential risk of exposure? Or if they're at home and, and, you know, usually it's been the case based upon the research that, you know, more women are taking care of the kids, then that re restricts the amount of work that you're able to do as people were less understanding. You know, thing I've seen, I, I, I've loved it uh, uh, so much. And even was seeing it last night on, I was watching, uh, our, you know, tell you even more about us, but one of our wind down shows is TMZ because it's, you know, it's mindless. I don't know half the people that are on there and it allows us just to be able to uh, go to sleep. And uh, one of the, the, the work, the, the lady that, you know, pitches news and on there, you know, they've all been at home. They're still doing the show from home. And, you know, she was there nursing, had her baby, and they were asking to see the baby. She held her baby up on camera. It's like, hey, you can still pitch news. You can still have a conversation, have a baby in your lap. And being able to see this change in the workplace that is potentially happened, uh, that makes it more, uh, that makes it easier for women. It makes it not easier, possible for uh, women to work would be one that would be interesting and is, you know, one of the potential, hopefully, a beneficial thing for scarring effects, but it could be uh, negative if uh, they're not, like I was talking about earlier, if they're not coupled back with the workforce at a uh, rate that they were uh, decoupled from the workforce. Next slide. 
it should be getting back to the end. Yes. So this is my summer slide, uh, uh, summarize and then leave it open for uh, if there's any additional questions uh, for businesses, you know, getting used to, you know, we've been in this, you know, almost a year now. So to getting used to the pandemic, still some downside risk. So it's still, we're not out of the woods. It still will be, you know, new normal. Anybody that's in healthcare, uh, got a degree in healthcare and talked to a lot of healthcare uh, professionals, you know, even with the vaccine, even as we have widespread uh, uh, inoculation in community, it's still going to be uh, social distancing and mask wearing will still be in place. You still have to do that in the workplace and like. Uh, conditions are good for generating inflation is what our president said, Jim Bullard. Uh, the pandemic, the recession was steep early on, similar to the Great Depression, but it's not lasting as long. So it's not like the Great, Great Depression in that. Also, one of the things as well that I didn't say earlier, Great Depression happened in 1929. It's about the time the Fed was, uh, you know, coming back online. And one of the things for having a strong central bank is so that you can have that liquidity and so that you can have markets keep on going. And that is one of the things that you've seen with all the activity, the trillions of dollars of activity that has uh, taken place. Uh, COVID recession, you see a larger decline in the purchase of services. So I saw that earlier in the revenue losses depending upon the pace of recovery. And then here's in Memphis zone talking about uh, where you've seen you know, less business activity, less business revenue, a couple of bright spots in a couple of areas as you talk about professional business services. And the consumer spending is down slightly in Memphis. But you know, up in some areas like healthcare, down and uh, like entertainment and like. Next slide. Here's just, uh, some more on the beige book, and we talked about mixed challenges and employment of people. You know, needing people to work, but obviously, you know, being able to find those folks it was already already hard before finding people, and then uh, a continuing challenge now of uh, those wage pressures pressure increasing slightly. You know, the manufacturing sector. It continued this robust growth, but it's still growing out of that hole. And then uh, the long-term scarred effects of, you know, bankruptcy and that change in capital. And if areas of capital become obsolete, then that change in behaviors long-term. Next slide. Here's one. We have conversations with, you know, a number of people on a regular basis. Uh, obviously, you know, can't talk to everybody on the phone, talk to as many as we can, myself and we have economists, regional economists and the like that are in uh, St. Louis. And here's a short URL. If you ever want to, you know, give information, uh, like I said, I'll make these slides a PDF and send them back out. But uh, you can go to that and then that allows you same exact questions that we were asked. You can enter it uh, there quickly on a phone. Next slide. Yep, and it should be last slide. And this is just my contact information. If you have any other, you know, questions later on, or uh, any additional uh, comments or anything for me, feel free to send me an email, give me a call, and I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer. So if there's any other questions, I'm, I'm more, more than happy to answer. Uh, Les was going to conduct the question Q&A. Okay. Is that a question, Adele? No, actually, we were just lamenting that, Doug, you don't have the lake sunset in your background. <laughs> but good information, good information. And we will look forward to the, to the deck because Chet is a business owner yeah. and can add some color to, um, you know, he's got some, some good, a good, perspective on um, business activity this past 18 months or so. Okay, perfect. Um, this is Rick Baker. Um, as, a, as a banker, I have a question. Okay. Will the Main Street Lending Program, you think, uh, in some fashion be revived? 
And that I'm still not sure about. We got a note on it the other day that obviously, you know, it was uh, ended at the end of last year. If they see a need for activity, then that, you know, Main Street Lender Program uh, will come back. That was being run out of the Boston Bank. And I know they've been monitoring to see if there is a need. Obviously, with you know, one of the benefits of having uh, former Fed Chair Yellen, who's now Secretary Yellen, in that spot that she understands how the Fed works and what the uh, mechanisms are. So if they do see a need for that program, obviously, I, you know, I think, yeah, with that one, it is some legislation that has to take place in order to make that happen. But the, my understanding is that, yes, they will uh, it reenact it if needed. Doug, um, any reactions? I guess this is a personal question that you might not be able to, to speak on behalf of the Fed, but with the um, all the executive orders that have just occurred and the um, stimulus that Biden, the Biden administration is trying to get passed, any comments about what you think that will do for the Memphis economy and at least for this region? So obviously, I gave my disclaimer earlier, uh, Denise, that these are my comments, not the comments of the Federal Reserve. But yeah, I, I think, it, I, I, I do think that uh, obviously having regions, you know, having worked when in, during the Obama administration, obviously Biden was vice president then, and having, uh, I was working with city government then, and, and there was a lot of direct outreach from the federal government, even to the standpoint of they have that, uh, SC2 Strong Cities, Strong Communities program that gave direct assistance. And my thought pattern is with all of this, you know, broad scale stimulus that's coming to the community, but they will look at communities that they know have been particularly hard hit, like, you know, Memphis and, you know, other communities and be able to make sure that those funds get there. Pam, I'm sure you have a question. Oh. <laughs> My, mine was about, and I don't even know how to formulate it, but I've been enormously concerned about the possible number of evictions that are going to happen in Memphis, and that will do what will that will do to the economy. Yeah, and that's a, a, a very good concern as well. From what I've heard on that, is that they were supposed to be continuing the eviction moratorium, but the larger concern has been that you know you have some landlords are just simply ignoring it. And I know they weren't for a while, they weren't processing here in Shelby County, and then they had started processing some of those evictions to court. But that is, you know, continues to be a concern. I thought that the, uh, I'm trying to remember the last guidance I saw from the uh, CDC on that, but I thought that they were going to ex extend that moratorium on, uh, on evictions. But yeah, that is a, obviously a huge concern because you have an individual that, you know, that already is in the home and you know if they're not paying their mortgage you know more than likely they've either lost the job or getting lower wages the thought pattern that you not only are you know getting lower wages or lost your job and now you're going to be out on the street or having to stay you know that's what we've seen a lot of as well is people then have to go and start staying with other people closer quarters and then increases the spread of the disease or the virus yeah and Pam, I can speak on that a little bit. Um, we had a meeting with uh, the city and um, Paul Young with the Housing mm -hmm. Community Development. And um, they did receive $28 million in funds recently for housing services and um, emergency rental assistance. But they're just working on planning to distribute those funds. Um, so they are in the process of um, trying to help out there. But yeah. Thank you very much. Pam Pitts, did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Other than the boys playing basketball in the backyard. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Any other questions? I was one of those houses in Central Gardens that sold in a day. <laughs> oh, man. That, that yeah, had to make you happy. I miss being there, but we, we had to move to a one story. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah but I, it's, yeah. It's, Wonderful neighborhood. And it, it was it was good that you were able to sell during that time because, you know, not only, I mean, obviously because they're selling so quick, you're seeing these prices are, are much higher than they have been. Yes. And that's what our realtor said. Look, they're coming in now and they're coming from California. And would you consider one showing? Because we weren't even going to uh -huh. put it in the market with COVID. 
They said, okay. okay, one showing at more than we were going to charge. And it that was her saying to us, uh -huh. now that's trying to gouge somebody. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We were fortunate, but I missed 35 years, uh, my 35 years in Central Gardens. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Douglas, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us because this has indeed been enlightening. This is not, let's give Douglas a hand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank <laughs> you. This is, this is not something we could read in the local paper and understand. So you've taken us to a new university and you'll have to come back. And I also want to comment on all of the wonderful service service commitments you have in our city. I don't think anyone has as many as you, Douglas. And, when <laughs> I, and, and we appreciate that because of course, you know, we are a service organization and we see service as the means to an end. And really that's what we're, that's what we're all here for. Uh, we're on this earth to give service. And it looks like you've taken that and just run with it. So really, we really appreciate that. And we're going to tonight just make you an honorary Rotarian for Midtown Memphis Rotary. <laughs> Let us know who you want to be other than, uh, other than honorary. <laughs> Thank you much. Thank we, you we much. Would I'm love that. <laughs> make sure I come back. Yeah, make sure you, we know where to find you. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> you too, Pam, and everyone. Uh, thank you, all of our guests and, um, of course, members. But it's been a great night, and we all leave with a uh, I don't know whether we could call this a master's degree in Fed. Uh, I think this might be a doctorate degree in Fed. Thank you, Douglas, for your doctorate, for giving us, the, honoring us with a doctorate degree in Fed. No problem at all. Great to see you all. Okay. My best to Nicole and the boys. Okay, we will do. Take care. Thanks, Douglas. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Um, Brian is going to, well, we have a, a COVID compassion project coming up. And Brian and Adele will tell us a little bit about that. And you're welcome, and everybody's welcome to stay because this is something that everyone can help on. And I think everyone will be engaged and excited about this project um, that the board came up with a couple of, well, about a month ago. And so, Brian and Adele, you want to tell us a little bit more about it? Well, I will just lead off by making real clear this isn't a shameless, you know, Midtown Rotary uh, church health solicitation. I, I didn't just come on to you know, to, to ask for, for assistance with this. But apparently um, we've already been chosen um, sort of for the COVID frontline kind of aspect of church health. Um, some of y'all were here for Jenny Bartlett Prescott's presentation and she she's on the city's board. So church health has been very involved. It's not thanking the development staff like me who's been sitting at home for uh, since March but this is for our frontline staff. So um, Adele, any, any uh, two cents on this? Only that, Brian, we really got to get going on it. <laughs> and, and I guess we'll work on recruiting um, sort of elves as we go sure. along. What is it? What is it? I don't understand. <laughs> So I, yeah, a little a, more detail might be good. So we're going to get cookies. Uh, for sort of all the frontline staff for church health. And I was hoping cookies are great, but sort of messages from the community um, of, of appreciation. Um, what I've found personally is gift officers like me are the ones that get the thank yous for what church health does. And it's the people doing the real work that sort of they come in and they go home many times without any kind of acknowledgement. So um, what I would sort of hope the group could help me with is just writing these the notes because they don't want to get notes from me. Um, <laughs> you know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, Brian, we'll we'll talk and then we'll have something more um, structured and organized to share with you all. Sure, but just in in spirit, um, I, I guess. Uh, if, if I, we could get a little help from the group writing with the note writing in particular, um, Adele and I will get the logistics all set out. Will this be a little bit like what we did with the people at St. Peter's somewhat? 
we wrote we wrote cards and mm -hmm. we gave you know mm -hmm. food and whatever so um yeah. to the yep. uh, the workers in the nursing homes absolutely good great i think people really need appreciation i think we all need that and we all need to show it yeah we do huh. Huh. <laughs> and, and we're talking about what possibly about 80 80 to 90 people brian I think that's right, right around 100. Um, okay, about and so 100. I'm not saying we got to write 100 notes. It could honestly be, you know, write one to the dental clinic, just a collection of notes. No, I think we should try and, well, that's nice. Okay. Yeah, let's let like everyone have a note. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, I, they're going to get, that taking this hard. step is already so much more appreciation. So, I mean, if we want to go all out, I'm not going to discourage, but uh, I think just sort of thanking teams might be the best way to do this. And any, any, any more good to see you. Um, I'm official now, official member of Rotary Midtown. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Welcome. And, and any of our guests that are willing to pick up a pen and <clears throat> An index card or write a note for Church Health Center because they they help all of us. It's not just a Midtown. Church Health Center is uh, what we are about and what we appreciate. And without Church Health Center, we had a, <clears throat> a speaker earlier, <clears throat> without Church Health Center, a lot of people wouldn't have health or they wouldn't have anywhere else to go. So they provide a great avenue for us. So if you're also interested in writing uh, a thank you note or and I can get you, we can get more information on it uh, as far as how we should do it from Adele and Brian. We really would appreciate it. Well, and to our guests, if anybody's interested in what you're, I'm not going to do some spiel now, but if anybody wants to know what Church Health does, it's sort of my job to tell you. So feel free to reach out um, just if you don't really have a background on, on the organization. Um, I'm happy to chat. Dustin, can you put Brian's information up so if anyone else wants to uh, participate in the love note writing? Yeah. Uh, Brian, did you have any idea of a uh, drop-off location or a deadline as well? What I can do, deadline, I think we talked about doing this around um, Valentine's Day, and if that's the, the objective, then we got to get, like Adele said, we need to get on this. But what I can promise to do is sort of all drop off and stuff can go through me. So it's more, you know, I'll try to make this easy. Okay. And here's my okay. email. Great. Thank you. Could, could we, can we get an up to date uh, membership directory? somehow just email to us or, uh, or how we can access it? Cause yeah, uh, we have one, but I had been blind copying on the email because uh, uh, several members didn't want their email publicly displayed. So if it's anyone in particular that you would like, Pam, just let me know. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it was just, you know, just a, uh -huh. uh, a legal, well, legal slash personal thing. So that's okay. why it's always blind copy. We'll try I to do that all the time. That. Yeah. 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 Any other any other questions? Uh, Carolyn, thank you for thank you for joining us. Do you do you promise to do you promise to send us some love <laughs> notes for Church Health Center? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Thanks, Carolyn. And I think Pam is gone, but I know I know how to find her so we can get some from her too. Uh share. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for joining Hello. us. Hi guys, thank you. I'm just making it home, so I didn't want to interrupt you all, but yeah, I, it was a really good meeting. I appreciate you all letting me come through. Great. And we'll be looking. We'll be looking for you for some love notes for Church Health Center too. <laughs> we act, I actually may be able to pull that off for you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And would Jason can maybe introduce himself? Uh, we don't know you. Some of yeah. us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Farmer. I'm actually a member of Memphis Central Rotary, 
and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Blacklands, I'm uh, sorry, BL Film Studios. So I was just emailing Mr. Myers, let him know we will write letters. Um, Pam works with me, Carolyn and Cecilia. So we are all, all part of the team at BLP and we'll write letters as well. Oh, great, great. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Awesome. A fantastic evening, awesome. yeah. This is a real right. service. This is a real yeah. service Tuesday, and we really appreciate it. Anything, any other comments? Of course, I, of course, the board and I appreciate everything. And even during this, uh, I guess we call it abnormal times, we've still been able to hold our head up and just keep trading water and keep going. So, thank you for all of your support and visitors, guests. Thank you for joining us, DJ. Anything you want to see, Ingrid? Uh, yeah, and I, I have a comment. I have a comment too because I really appreciate you sending the cards that you have sent to me and uh, keep me that way in the loop and let me know you're thinking about me. I mean, here I'm sitting here in my room, have five kids out there, two of them banging my door, so I I cannot even stay on there uh, the whole time or so. But just appreciate that you all keep thinking of me and sending me those notes. Absolutely. We love you, Ingrid. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hey there. Ingrid. Hugs and kisses to you, Ingrid. Great to see you. Okay. And, uh, Thanks. The thought just came to mind in regards to uh, Douglas and uh, the whole Federal Reserve Bank that here in Memphis, we have such a, a large population of those who live in poverty. And just this Christmas in working with one of our fo former Rotaractors who came back, we had 75 children who actually got a chance. And you think about those families are all unbanked. So they have no banking relationships. However, we were able to use the Federal Reserve Bank's online financial literacy courses and to teach them uh, just some tips about entrepreneurship, uh, credit, and it was just awesome. So they have a whole line of access in that way. So uh, Charlotte, when you talk to Douglas, uh, please uh, give him an update. And uh, we certainly appreciate the partnership that happened there during the Christmas time. Right, I'm glad he'll be, I'm sure he'll be glad to hear that. I, I'll do that. Okay, so any other comments, Rick? This yeah, I had a, a quick comment for Belinda. Belinda, do you work for Youth About Business? I'm not sure if BJ. BJ. She's muted. Mute. Okay. Um, I think I tried to reach out to her uh, about the Youth Action Board that Community Alliance is forming. And I think it might be uh, maybe something possibly up her alley, though, too. And then, um, Charlotte, I could talk to you later about the um, other project that Community Alliance is planning to do. Um, yeah. with foster children, if you'd like as well. But Great. yeah, I'm just gonna try to catch her on that, but. We're, we're on fire. <laughs> yes, Dustin, I had just sent you uh, my information and asked you to give me a call so that we can get on the same page there. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Well, thank you everyone. Any other, any other comments, questions, compliments? Uh, yes. Uh, well wishes? You. Thanks for joining us, Jason. We'll be in touch. But uh, yeah. thanks for joining us and the interest in Churchill. And don't be a stranger. We're second and fourth, second and fourth Tuesdays, five thirty. And if you and if you send us your email, we'll send you an email personally. Um, okay. So is that it for tonight? That's it. Thank you, everyone, and have a and have a wonderful, wonderful two weeks until we till we meet again. Oh, and when we meet again, we'll have the mindful meditation again, uh, part two with Judge Butch Childress. So that, that might be something you would really enjoy. So join us then. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Good night. All right, Thank you. Good night. And I'll send that information to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Great meeting. Thank you.